Hey everybody, my name is Alex Merced. I'm a developer advocate at Dremio, and today what I wanted to do is just do a, over, uh, a basically a hands-on workshop of how to just kind of get hands-on with Apache Iceberg and Spark, so that we can try out Apache Iceberg, run a few queries, do some cool stuff. So I'm going to be doing this based on this article that I wrote here on the Dremio.com blog, Introduction to Apache Iceberg Using Spark. Okay, I'll put a link to it it's on wherever I post this. Um, but definitely check out this article and make sure you check out the Apache Iceberg 101 article. You'll find lots of great resources and other hands-on exercises there. Okay. And again, if you're, have, if you're not familiar with Dremio, make sure you head over to the main page and try it out real quick. And it's really, really easy. All you have to do is click on right here, start test drive. And within a few minutes, you'll have been able to try out the platform. Can't beat that. Okay, let me just put that back over there. So what we're going to do is just going to walk through just kind of how to set this up. So what you will need is you will need Docker. Okay, so you need to have Docker installed in order to do this exercise. And it's generally pretty straightforward. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to use a special Docker container, uh, a Docker image that I created for this exercise to make just kind of getting started and up and running pretty easy. So basically we'll just run this command here. So if you, I already have the container pulled, or at least I should. Um, and then you're just going to run this command. And just basically what this command is doing is we're going to run the Docker container. We're going to give it a name, Iceberg Sandbox, so that way we can easily turn it off, turn it on if we want to continue working with it. And we're going to use this image, and we're going to turn it on in interactive mode. So that way, basically, once it's spun up, it's going to put us in the shell of the container. So I'm just really going to copy that, put that right into my... And again, this is assuming you have Docker installed. So if you're not sure you have Docker installed, you can always do Docker version. And you should get a version number. Then that confirms you have Docker installed and it's working. Everything's yay. Um, so as long as that's the case, then paste the command. Okay. Let me just make sure that's all on one line. Yep, okay. So you want to make sure it's all on one line. Okay. And then you're going to hit enter. And just kind of let it start up. So it's going to take a second for the container. And now the container is up and running. Okay, and now if I were to do an ls in here that lists all the files that are in this container, we'll notice that there's this iceberg init.bash script here. Okay, so the idea here is that this script's going to kind of automatically have everything you need to just kind of get iceberg started in here. Okay, but just so you can see what the command looks like in there, let's just cat that real quick. So cat iceberg init.bash. Okay, and basically what it's doing is this command here. So it's doing Spark SQL with all these flags. So just kind of walk through what these flags do. This flag here, the packages flag, is going to outline any packages you want Spark to install when it starts up. So of course we're going to want the Spark Iceberg Spark runtime. If you're using like a project Nessie catalog, you might also want the Nessie SQL extensions added on there as well, uh, or the Nessie libraries. And then you would also want the Nessie SQL extensions in this other category here. Uh, this is Spark SQL extension, so these add on extra SQL language uh, while you're in the session. Okay, so right now we're just adding on the Iceberg Spark session ex extensions, There's additional extensions if you want to use like Nessie, so that way you can do like merging, branching, stuff like that. We'll do that in a later workshop, so do make sure to follow, uh, subscribe, or whatever to wherever you're seeing this. So uh, whether it's a LinkedIn page or YouTube or wherever. Okay. And then what we're going to want to do is this cat, this right here. Basically, what we're doing is we're just setting the uh, Spark catalog settings. Okay, that's not, that's pretty standard. Uh, now, more interestingly, here what we're doing is we're setting the we're creating a catalog. Okay. Um, basically, what the idea is you're going to say, hey, the, for you to interact with Iceberg, you need to create a namespace, and that namespace we're just going to call it Iceberg. Okay. So basically, what I'm saying, hey, we're going to create a catalog. And the name of that catalog can be Iceberg. And that's going to be the namespace by which we, we interact with Iceberg uh, tables during the Spark session. Okay, that's going to be a type hive, which is the default um, for our purposes, because we're just going to be using it straight in this Docker container. We're not going to uh, be doing anything particularly special. We're not connecting to any external catalogs. We're not writing to S3. Uh, and just basically everything's being done in the file system. So that's where we're going to use the Hadoop type catalog. That's the file system catalog. Okay, um, then we are going to, to uh, say, hey, this is a, a Spark catalog, this Iceberg namespace that's using the Hadoop catalog. And whenever we write a table, this is the warehouse location. So this is basically the, the, um, the directory that it'll write uh, the data to. Okay, so, and we'll confirm that afterwards. So that's pretty much it. 
think there might be like another line. No. Okay, so that's what that says. But if you're using this particular image, you don't have to worry about writing all that. You can just type in iceberg init. Okay, I made sure that the script was preset up. So that way you can just type in iceberg init and it's going to start up Spark with all those settings that you see here all nice and set up. Okay, and you see it's kind of doing that. So you see like Spark is starting up and right now it's downloading those Spark packages that we specified. So it's downloading those jars. Okay, now it's going to be based setting up Spark. If you read to the output, eventually you see like it kind of configures a catalog and all that really good stuff. Okay, so it's doing that, it's doing that. Okay, and it, just, it takes about like a minute since we're doing it locally in our local computers. It's just like a, a small local instance of Spark running. So it goes and it goes. Okay, a positive recording so that way you don't have to watch me wait. But it's done now, so it's, again, it's going to take about like a minute. Um, but you'll know it's done because you'll see the Spark SQL prompt. Okay, so that means, yay, we can start writing SQL uh, in this Spark session. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this create table statement. Now let's just talk about what's going on here. Notice that the way I write this, I always have to write prefix every table that I'm referring to is with iceberg. Because essentially the word iceberg is a namespace that we configured. Where is that coming from? From here, when I configured my Spark session in that command, in that script, Notice I gave that catalog the name of Iceberg. That name can change, so you can call it whatever you want. So if you wanted the catalog to be cheese or uh, whatever you want to call it, you can call it that. Okay, there's no, it's it's not, it's a namespace of your choosing. Okay, I usually would call it something that relates to the catalog itself. So in this case, we're just, it's a plain vanilla file thing, so we're just going to call it Iceberg. But if I were using like Project Nessie, I'd call it Nessie. If I were using uh, Dremio Arctic, I'd call it Arctic. Generally, I like to name it after the catalog that I'm connecting to. Okay, it makes it easier for me to think through. Don't we love semanticness? Okay, but essentially, then after that, I, after this namespace, then it's, this is just basically the table name. Okay. So if I paste that in there, okay, and then I we run that query. Okay, and again, this was like we're running this as like a single node local thing, so it'll it'll not be like blazing fast because again we're running this on a, through our laptop but you, there we go the query is done okay so the table is created nice let's insert some records into the table so we're gonna run this insert okay and again this is all just pretty much standard SQL that you're used to so we'll insert these records into that uh, table okay so that's gonna get inserted okay so now what we'll do is we will update the record now keep in mind Anytime there's a change to the table, it's going to be creating a snapshot. Okay, and we'll kind of confirm that a little bit later on. So basically, we created a snapshot when we created the table. Okay, so that was snapshot one, where there was no data in the table. We inserted some records in the table that created another snapshot where that data got inserted. And now we're going to be doing an update. The data is changing, so another snapshot is being created. Okay, so I'm going to update some, a record. Okay. Okay, now we're going to change the table again. We're going to alter the table. Okay, and again, that is going to cause changes in the metadata, which means a new snapshot or a new metadata file. So I'm going to do that. Basically, what this is going to do is going to add a column to the schema so I can change schema. So the point being is that not only can I just run all my normal SQL against my, my iceberg table, but I can also evolve the schema of the table. Okay, I can add columns, I can drop columns, I can change the column type which may seem like, hey, I can do that in a database, in a data warehouse, no problem. But the thing is that when you're interacting with an iceberg table, you're not interacting with a database or a data warehouse. You're interacting with the sea of files you have on your data lake. And that's what's special about this. It makes working with your data lake feel like you're working with a database. Okay, that's the reason why table formats matter. Okay, it basically allows you to turn all these pieces, your, your, your file storage, your file formats, all these different pieces, put them together, and treat them as if they were a encapsulated database. So I'm going to go alter the table. Bam, and see, query happens. Wonderful. Let's add another record again. That's going to be another snapshot because again, the table is changing. Anytime the table changes, a new snapshot is created. Okay. And then again, now let's actually query the table and take a look at the state of everything. So if I hit copy, and then we'll paste the select. We're going to select all. Okay, and I can see that all the records are there. The only one that has an email is that one that we inserted that did have an email. 
but that email column does exist. Okay, so even though a lot of these records were, were added before the email column existed, it was able to take care of that. Okay, so uh, wonderful. Okay, now there's a little bit more to this article where we work about work with working with external files. I'm going to recommend that you go actually read the article to do the rest of this exercise. But what I want to do is show you just some of the files that get created. So the exit Spark SQL, we just exit. Okay, and now we're back in the Docker container shell. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to do an ls just so you can see what's happened. And now there's, notice that there's this folder called dir a warehouse. Okay, so if we go back to the settings that we passed. We said that anything we write should be stored in this directory, warehouse. Okay, so if I go in there, cd warehouse. Okay, and then we do an ls in there. Actually, I'll just do a quick clear just to kind of clear things up. Okay, and if we do an ls in here, we see that there's a folder called db. So notice that basically when you're using the file system, this first piece of the identifier is the catalog name. But then after that, it's kind of like directory, 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 directory. Then the name, the last part is always the data, the actual table name. Okay, so if I were to call this like dot db dot db dot my table, it would actually create a folder db, another folder db, and then inside of there would have been the table. So if I go inside that folder, cd db, okay, and I do an ls in there, I see there's my table, okay, which is a folder, and I cd into my table, and I'm going to, I should see two directories in there. Okay, so there's going to be two folders, one for my data and one for my metadata. Okay, so basically all my parquet files with the actual data will be here in the data folder. And basically the metadata that the engines will use to query this data will be in here. Okay. And let's see here. Um, let's First, let's ls data so you can see the parquet files. So you can see all these parquet files that were written there. Okay, that make up the data that we, we saved. Okay, and then if I do an ls of metadata, okay, we can see all of these metadata files. Okay, so you see like there's five metadata files. Okay, each one, every time the table changed, a new one of these got created. Okay, so these kind of add up over time, which is where like cleanup operations come into play, such as cleaning up orphan files, expiring snapshots, all that fun stuff. Conversation for another day. Okay, but again, if you check out the Dermio blog, we got articles on all of that. Okay, then you'll see that there's these Avro files. Okay, so you see these ones that have that are prefixed with the word snap. Those are the snapshot files, also referred to as a manifest list. Okay, they represent one snapshot. So essentially one of those got created every time the data changed. So there's three because basically there was really only three changes. We, we create a table, but that doesn't create a snapshot, uh, uh, a manifest list because there's no data yet. Again, the snapshots tr track the data. So then we inserted records. So that's going to create one. Then we inserted another, we inserted some more records, that would be two, and then we did an update, so that would be three. Okay, so changing the structure of the table did add more metadata.json because that's where the schema is tracked. Okay, so you can kind of see how this is all lining up. And then these Avro files here that don't have the word snap at the beginning, these are the manifests. These are the things that actually list the individual files, these parquet files. Um, that lists them and say, hey, these are the files that are part of the table and have metadata on those individual files. Okay, so you can see like it's writing all of this. And again, it doesn't have to necessarily be with Spark, whether I write this with Dremio or other engines, this is going to be the setup. And then the cool thing about that is because they're all using this format, the structure that Apache Iceberg creates, then all the other engines can see this, read the same data, and you have a consistent view of your data across the tools that you use. That's the beauty of the idea of open okay they, the idea of an open lake house is that you can have your data and all the tools can see your data and interact with your data so basically I could have ingested this using spark streaming okay ingested this into iceberg tables into s3 and then load them up into Dremio and then from Dremio I can then like document the data distribute the data you know govern the data and do all that fun semantic layer stuff there and you know allow all my data consumers to be able to consume my data from Dremio okay so so you can start thinking sort of like the implications of this whole open aspect of it. So my name is Alex Merced, developer of Advocate Dremio. Again, if you haven't tried out Dremio yet, go head over to uh, Dremio Test Drive. Okay, so again, that's gonna, you'll find that button right there. Okay, and have a great day.
I'll see y'all later.